I'm just gonna give you. that this is working. Uh, yes, it's required for seven of the So that's the one I just So this one must oh, like you. I do. It's kind of like more my calling. This class I actually I taught last semester, so it's kind of well, I picked up the grooves well, of the class. I guess I don't know if I'm outside of the is that actual speakers are coming in. Well, that's not very challenging. Okay. Yeah. 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 Teaching perspective. <laughs> Don't thank he'll be here today. He's in the three Yeah. Hey, I Good. Good. He's enjoying it. So, yeah. yeah, I started teaching him programming in seventh grade, and he just, I mean, <laughs> took off with it. No. <laughs> Or kids? Uh, no, some of the kids we were talking about. Um, wow. Um, and then I'm just I actually got a dog almost twenty five. I'm just thinking that they're just oh big cat? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh, I have a liver transplant. So yeah. Big life changes. So yeah, that's sort of delayed the family for a little while. No, it is not. Yeah, it picks up. You can probably walk over here. I need a clicker. I don't want to walk over here. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, there were only two of us. Good feedback. All right, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Today we have um, Dr. Dan Pogba. He's the director of our Larry Institute here at U of M. He's been um, working in the field of robotics for the past 30 years, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, he's come to us today to talk about his adaptive robot nursing assistant for hospitals and what he's been working with um, in terms of robotics for helping out hospitals. So let's give him the floor. And then, uh, well, thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So hello, everybody. Um, so today I'll talk about uh, our adaptive robot nurse assistant. They call it the ARNA robot. Uh, this is a project that um, it's been running ever since I got to U of L in 2016. So long time. It took us some years to build this robot and operate it. Uh, but in general, uh, before I show you more about the robot, I want to start with uh, an introduction about human robot collaboration. So what does that mean? Um, first of all, uh, this robot that I'll talk about today and a lot of research on human robot collaboration takes uh, takes life at the Robotics Institute here at U of L. We call it Larry. Uh, one of your faculty members, uh, Dr. Roussel, is a uh, is an associate director of this institution. We have um, faculty from all departments at the Speed School, about 13 faculty that are active in this facility right next to Engineering Garage. If you haven't had a chance to visit it, um, you can stop by. Um, and uh, on March 19 at 1 p.m. we have an open house. So when you come in, you'll see 20 some robots in action and 40 some students manning those robots. And we tell people that whenever we have robots, we don't replace people. We have opportunities for people to interact with the robots. Um, over the past eight years or so, we've done a lot of projects. A lot of it sponsored by NSF. Uh, we uh, support a lot of graduate and also undergraduate students. Some of our graduate students I recognize in attendance today and uh, Again, if you're interested in opportunities for um, getting jobs like research uh, positions, uh, contact me later. Uh, one of our flagship projects is this project called Campers. Uh, it's been running for five years now. It's a very large project. It's uh, all inclusive to all Kentucky institutions, including University of Kentucky and some of the smaller universities. Um, the theme of this project is called Kentucky Advanced Manufacturing Partnership for Enhanced Robotics and Structures. Like a mouthful, but acronym NICE is CAMPERS. And the idea behind this project is um, if we want human robot collaboration, we really need to focus on these interfaces between humans and robots. So, how do we transmit data from the human to the robot and vice versa? It's a little bit like a fighter pilot in a jet to do fly by wire and they wear all kinds of interface devices not just the ones that we're used to in gaming but a lot more advanced things for example monitors of heart rate monitors of brain activity monitors of uh, heart rate and so on so imagine we have wearable devices um, and on the left, you see a worker. So let's say in a manufacturing environment, could be in a healthcare environment as well. High tech nurse wearing a electronic shirt, electronic helmet, Google Glass, uh, tactile gloves. Okay. And through these devices, it's communicating intent towards some robotic equipment. It could be robot, but it could also be some kind of movable production machine that's on the factory floor. Then they have to in turn receive information from sensors on those robots about what is going on remotely, right? Uh, so if you're going to do this again with the analogy of the fighter pilot, you do need to take care of this massive amount of data that has to move between the two. And studies have shown with fighter pilots that if there's too much information, then the, the human gets overwhelmed. So we need to curate that information and we introduce uh, in between this. AI component, but essentially it's going to compress this data for us, get the more salient features, present that to the user, and it goes in both ways. And it all has to happen 
fairly quickly. You can't have huge time delays. So we call this paradigm a collaborative human robot interface, not a fixed interface, but something that changes over time. It changes according to the preferences of the user. Uh, so in this project, we were focused on a lot of different things, but um, here at UofL, we work on sensors, embedding them into robotic equipment and wearables, as well as uh, machine learning to curate this data and create this adaptive interface in between. I'll move on to the next slide. So part of the technology is what we call the collaborative robot. So what's a collaborative robot? It's a robot that's designed to work with people, uh, not just through teleoperation, but in some instances physically. So if we have a robot that we can push around or teach by demonstration, it'll make it much more intuitive to program this robot and make it uh, help us with daily tasks. Uh, so conventional industrial robots are pretty dangerous and pretty dumb. They they are not aware of our presence, so they can easily hurt us. If you go to the Ford plant, they're caged. Essentially, they're put away from the workforce. Uh, these days, there's a big push to sensorize the robot and also endow the human with different sensors so that the manufacturing cell or the environment is aware of the presence of the human. You see examples of these collaborative robots. This paradigm was introduced about 10 years ago, um, where Instead of programming the robot with the teaching pendant, you actually tug it, you push and pull it and show it a task, and then it can repeat that task and it can adapt to the environment. You see here uh, industrial core robot or collaborative robot. Uh, this robot here is for home environments called the PR2. This is about 10 years, picture about 10 years ago from my lab at University of Texas at Arlington. Well, we had a living lab, so the robot was getting beers for people from the fridge, opening the fridge, cooking pancakes, stuff like that. Um, so there are some challenges with robots like this, okay? Because they are smarter and lighter, uh, they're not as heavy, they're also flimsy and flexible, that makes it more difficult to control. Anything that's flexible, it's harder to control. Um, so we we worked over the last few years on nonlinear uh, controllers that are also adaptive. Um, also, there are lots of users and tasks, so the robot needs to adapt to different users and their different preferences. So that's another challenge. So if you're going to put sensors on the robot, uh, then you're looking at calibration issues. How do we calibrate these sensors for everybody? Everybody's a little bit different. All these sensors will degrade over time. Somebody spills water on them, you know, they're not going to perform the, the way you expect. So there's a lot of issues related to usability, reusability, and cost of these types of um, structures. But there are many advantages we get to, to this where we could have humans and robots in each other's workspace. Um, one of the technologies that is missing uh, and it's been a holy grail in robotics for 50 years, is this idea of electronic skin. Electronic skin that has sensors uh, of different kinds. One example is tactile sensors. So just like our skin, I can look for my keys in my pocket. I don't need vision. I don't need a camera. Lots of advances with cameras, but tactile is very important in actually getting objects be manipulated uh, by a robot. Okay, so um, we have worked over the last uh, 10 years on tactile skins. We call it e-skin, electronic skin. There's some patented technology here at UofL. And we can actually make these in the clean room um, here at, uh, in SRB, right across. Um, you can see here clean room made. You see my cursor. Uh, this is an array of 11 by 11 sensors. And then if we deploy them on the robot, we have to be very mindful of resolution. Uh, if you look at ourselves, the tactile resolution in our fingertips about a millimeter. That means discrimination between two points. If you, uh, um, if you use a needle, you'll be able to discriminate a millimeter apart to two points. Whereas here in our forehead is about an inch. We, that's because we don't really need a lot of resolution here in our forehead or around here. 
because uh, we're not, not really manipulating anything finely like we do with our fingertips. So if we're going to put these things on a robot, we have to design them so that they are useful for different tasks. Um, so we can actually modulate the spacing of these sensors, the sensitivity of these sensors. Um, and we built this device here, it's called the OctoCan. It looks like a can with 128 tactile sensors that are arranged around it that you can squeeze with your hand. And you can use that as an electronic handle for a robotic device. So uh, I spoke about human robot collaboration. And in fact, uh, if we take inspiration for human computer collaboration, right, this is how this started is with HCC. It's been around longer than HRC. Um, people speak about uh, four levels of uh, human computer collaboration. Level zero, level, sorry, level one, you have apps like that you use as tools like spread, you know, spreadsheet or word processor. Level two would be a, an assistant like Cortana is an example. Google search is an example, chat GPT now exists an example. Um, level three would be a peer. So it will be a computer system that is your peer. So you can perform similar functions at a company, let's say in the workplace. Um, basically, you can separate the workload at an equal level to a human. So chat GPT is kind of getting there that it's, it's able to, you know, replace you, right? Or compete with you in certain professions, right? Level four would be a computer system that is your manager. Okay, so that actually, no, that is a dystopian view. We don't want to have be managed by, by computers, right? So it's similar to robots now. If we look at robotics, level one would be a tool. So a, a, a robot that's collaborative that you can teach by demonstration, like I was telling you with tactile sensors or you can uh, interact in other forms of natural ways, like you can give it verbal commands, uh, you can wave at it and other things. Okay, that would be a tool. And you can use that to help you complete a job. Let's say you want to pick up a heavy object, the robot has a lot of strength, it'll do that for you, but you still need to guide it with some sort of either tactile or verbal cues. Level two would be an assistant, okay? An assistant, kind of like your vehicle that you relinquish control and regain control from, and it can do some autonomous tasks on its own. Okay, so here, very important you need to negotiate for control authority. You don't want to get into a fight, right? And it's a big deal right now with driverless vehicles. But these assistants can do simple tasks that humans can do, and our robot nurse assistant is at this level. It's at level two right now. It has some kind of learning, but it's very limited. Okay. It's low level learning. So learning is there to personalize the experience, to learn your preferences and that sort of thing. Level three would be a peer or a partner. Okay, so we call our robot, uh, robot nurse assistant. It's not a nurse replacement. It's not another nurse that is robotic, right? And that's a big deal. Uh, but uh, if you were to construct that, it, that thing has to have some adaptation, some, some form of learning, kind of like another human, that you are able to replace somebody in, in, the, in that function. So learning there will occur at multiple levels and times. Um, if I were to make an analogy from a cognitive perspective, this would be like a VR in a video game, it looks like an AI in a video game. It has some intelligence just like you, you kind of, it's your body that's helping you. Uh, and in a physical sense, what that would be look like is somebody that can, you can dance with, you push and tug and you can create some sort of dance that is very, very smooth, okay? It's not like you push and pull in different directions. So uh, if we were to get to peers, they would have to have this sort of performance. And level four, that would be if the robot is your manager. Well, that's not a good thing, but it could be uh, in the future if your robot is your companion. So it follows you around throughout life, it stores your experiences, and then it lives on with your experiences ever after. There are people actually working on this sort of thing, uh, 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 robot companions.
but so there's lots of ethics issues that come up here. OK, so. Now I'm going to show examples with uh, different uh, of different uh, things from past work at my lab. So. Uh, and in these videos, you see examples of tools uh, for human robot collaboration. So you could, as I said, push and pull on those robot. It'll kind of dance for you so you can guide it. If you have a prosthetic device using a sensorized glove, you can mirror, reflect the motion from one limb to another. So if you have a healthy limb, you can kind of show the, the prosthetic device what to do. And that can help you to do cooperative manipulation with two hands. So my student here is actually wearing this and um, demonstrating essentially reflective motion so that he can manipulate a large object. He's not an amputee, but he's wearing some sort of a prosthetic interface there. And he actually took that prototype home and he lived with it for a few days and figured out can he, can he do daily tasks with it. Um, I mentioned uh, this uh, living lab, um, that PR2 robot on the right uh, upper corner is learning to pour a glass of wine. So somebody is actually teaching it by demonstration with tactile cues, uh, where to pick up the glass, how to pour the wine. And then at the end of that, I'll press replay and the robot will pick up the glass and pour the, the glass of wine. Uh, again, it's, it's called learning from demonstration. Here you see uh, in the bottom, you see again guidance, physical guidance by pushing as well as a remote uh, joystick inter interface. This is cooperative manipulation where the robot is doing half the job. It's pushing on the cart. The human is kind of guiding it. It's kind of tugging. And then here, this would be an example of uh, robotic bin picking where the robot's actually looking for objects that are placed in those bins and trying to differentiate and pick them up autonomously. So that would be um, autonomous operation here. So um, tactile sensing plays a big role. If we want to do any of these demonstrations um, and also curating, I mentioned this uh, the data, we have a lot of data with uh, embedded AI. Uh, also, vision plays a big role. Uh, robot being aware of where the human is uh, visually is, is, is also important. All right, so now I'm getting to the robot nurse assistant. So um, we developed this robot starting in 2016. We had funding from NSF and um, we uh, spent my students spent several years at Engineering Garage putting it all together. I have a video showing that. This is one of the uh, uh, forms of the robot. There's a base, uh, there's a handlebar where you push and pull on that robot, kind of like a tug. There's a robotic arm with a riser on the robot, and there are many sensors around the robot to, for it to be able to navigate autonomously. And this picture is taken in S, uh, SRV here across the uh, building. Um, we have a patent that we filed a few years ago. You see that there. And we took this robot to various facilities. One of them is at School of Nursing downtown. We loaded in a truck and drove it there. And we kept it there for about six months and we let nursing students play with it. Um, and we are getting ready to from Larry to take it to uh, U of L hospital on the on the floor in a few months. So uh, some of the things that this robot uh, can do uh, in terms of research uh, capabilities. So we have a learning controller. We call it a newer adaptive learning controller. I'll show you to you in a second or the NAC. This simulates low level learning in a, of motor tasks, similar to how we, we learn things with rewards and penalties. Um, this controller has some safety guarantees, so we have some guarantees that's going to work with the number of users. Uh, we can incorporate in this uh, controller things like user intent and anticipating user intent from tactile cues. 
or different types of task models or tasks. Uh, maybe we want the robot to go faster or slower or in a some sort of prescribed way we call that task model. Um, so this NAC actually can also incorporate uncalibrated or noisy sensors uh, from robotic skins. Um, and it can deal with uncertain and unmodeled flexible robots. So lots of advantages for this. That is one of the differentiators. So inside here we have two computers that are running a lot of algorithms and one of them is this new adaptive controller. So here's a video on the design and build. You see the years from 2016 to 2019, that's sort of a finished product at School of Nursing. But it started with a very heavy base and those four, we call it omnidirectional wheels. So those wheels can move sideways or forward and backward or Swedish wheels, another design. Um, you can then coordinate those four wheels and get, you know, rotations in arbitrary directions. So that base, uh, weighs uh, about 250 kilos right now. So very heavy, but it's very nimble and agile on the uh, floor there at Engineering Garage. And you can see that's actually a very strong base. Okay, so uh, it has been designed to pull a hospital bed. Uh, so technically to pull a hospital bed. Uh, we have a tablet interface uh, where we can actually get sensor data that are deployed. There. There's a, a range of sensors around the robot. And this is initial test. My grad students actually had fun riding on the robot. So you can ride on it, kind of like a scooter. Um, that e-stop is very important in case you run into something or you want to stop emergency stop it. And eventually uh, we placed all our electronics, there's batteries, there's motors and so on. Um, with the LiDAR you can do autonomous navigation. So you can build a map of the environment then send it to different locations. Uh, in, in, let's say in that, that's at School of Nursing. You can also write on it. So if you're a patient you can write on it, but the design uh, it's designed that way to be able to assist, uh, uh, serve as an uh, assistive walker. So you can walk with it uh, and you can also do something called patient sitting which involves providing items for a patient or monitoring a patient and so on. Uh, so in that case, uh, uh, Sumit was a PhD student in my lab and a research scientist later at the Mary. He is uh, being driven, but he can also actively use that handlebar and drive the robot himself. This uh, video goes on for some time. So some of the things that the robot needs to be able to do is navigate around obstacles. So we have sonar sensors, for example, to detect where that trash can is and guide the robot around it. There's a LiDAR in the front. And we have conducted lots of trials with nurses. Uh, so that would be a nurse and a patient, or two nurses in that case. Uh, well, we are interested in usability. Questions about is this useful to you? Um, patient ambulation is very important in a hospital because it often determines how fast patients recover, but there are not enough nurses or staff to do the walking. So if the robot can actually do the patient walking, they'll get discharged faster. That's the idea. All right, moving on. Um, these are some control block diagrams of this new adaptive controller. Uh, I don't have time to go into a lot of details here, but uh, what I want to say is that this runs in real time. So the control loop, you're taking controls. It executes every 300 hertz, so it's a very fast control loop. Uh, similar to the way the loops get closed in our brain. So we close the loop at about 100 uh, milliseconds, I think is for touch to the brain and back to the muscle. It's about 100. That's, uh, that's a little slower, but still there's a control loop, right? That's running in our brains that's allowing us to stand and do all kinds of uh, motor tasks. Um, and in the middle of that loop, there's a, it's a neural network. So this is a learning controller with a neural network. 
Uh, and uh, there's actually proof that this controller works and it has the performance that it, that it does. Okay. Uh, so is this AI, is this machine learning? Yes, it is, but we call it neuroadaptive controller to indicate that it's actually more like our brain and that there's a real time uh, requirement for this. And one of the problems with machine learning, even today is that you do the learning offline. You gather lots of data, you do all this learning, and then you spit the answer. And with robots, you need to do that on the fly. You can't just collect data, think about it, and then give an answer, right? You have the robot needs to compute that very quickly. So right now, if you watch the most agile robots, Boston Dynamics, maybe you've seen those videos of quadrupeds, those are all running these controllers at very high loop rates. And they're running things that have neural networks inside or model predictive controls, another approach. All right. So we uh, we can uh, configure this robot as a walker. We um, actually ran experiments in the lobby here of SRB, basically tagging this robot and pushing it in different um, configurations like for example, following a square or a rectangle on the floor. And we were interesting, interested to see how closely can you follow lines on the floor or certain patterns on the floor, how much effort you have to do push and pull. Obviously the, the less effort, the better. Although for rehabilitation, you may want to actually control the amount of effort. And then we looked at metrics, like um, if we give a reference trajectory, what are the velocity errors, how much torque is required by the user versus what the robot motors are seeing. And another important metric is how jerky is this robot? You tug on it, it should not go like this. It should be a smooth operation. And we did this with many users and the answer is this controller actually performs a lot better than see here PD proportional derivative where these are standard controls that are not tunable. Uh, performs much better. Also, it can go up ramps uh, and deal with uh, uncertain up, um, uh, states. Uh, another thing that uh, happened is that uh, nursing students actually liked this robot quite a bit, so they were very excited. Now, nursing students are a little younger. There's some older nurses and not too excited about about these robots, but generally younger generation, very receptive. Um, another thing we did, this was during COVID. Um, you see here is my students in SRB again, very excited to use this robot to do disinfection things. They tried to disinfect not doorknobs. Um, this was again during COVID, everything was shut down. But that robot is holding a UV one, so with the UV you can kind of you know, destroy viruses and bacteria. Um, so that would be a doorknob. Um, there are many uh, uses actually where we're getting calls from a Jewish hospital. They want to take the robot to the COVID ward and just leave the robot there and load the robot with all kinds of items, send it in so that they don't have to get into the COVID ward, right? So very, lots of uses. Um, but uh, since then, you know, less interest in in that. And so this is, uh, if you're familiar with SRB, that's the hallway in SRB. The robot's kind of moving around trying to disinfect doorknobs and door handles. Um, another thing we did is we're looking at commercialization. So we had uh, an i -Core team project. This is a national project to look at. Is this useful with uh, with the C-suite in the hospital actually like this idea would they pay for it. Um, uh, we had uh, interviews with hundreds of potential users and there is actually a value proposition that was developed uh, based on this ambulation um, idea that if you ambulate patients, they will leave faster, that reduces cost of healthcare. Uh, and a, uh, we had a CEO that in the back of the envelope, he said, if you can reduce the stay by one hour, then it will save me a billion dollars. It was close. It was hundreds of millions of dollars, actually. So it's, a, it's actually a big deal. 
So we think there's actually a commercial path for this robot. All right, so uh, now currently we have another grant from NSF. It's from a program called Future of Work. So this program is interested is if there were robots like this in hospitals, how would that change the workplace for nurses? Okay, so in this grant we have um, a nursing faculty member, uh, Dr. Nasrawi from computer science, and then two collaborators from Oklahoma State University, and they're interested in uh, economic impact and also usability of the robot. And uh, we have several objectives, but with these, with this particular program at NSF, we're interested in which tasks are mostly uh, um, should we focus on that the robots can do? Which nursing tasks are more um, uh, are better or justified? Uh, what are the interfaces or technologies that we need to put on these robots so that they are usable? Um, what's the impact of productivity and stress reduction of nurses? And the fourth objective is what's the uh, economic impact? Okay, so these are all four things. Uh, our project still are wrapping up in the fall. Uh, but we're looking at two examples of things in the hospital. One is uh, prevention of falls, so walking with fall prevention, and patient sitting with fetching. So patient sitting, hospitals actually hire these sitters. They sit with a patient for 24 hours, sometimes longer, and the idea is if something happens, they just call the nurse. So. These are low tech jobs. Not a lot of people want to do these jobs and there's a shortage of available. Um, uh, but they're big expenses uh, for hospitals. So if the robot can be there. Uh, you know that would that would be an advantage. So one of the things that we're doing with this robot is we're creating this collaborative uh, interface. Um, so in this video on the left, so here's the idea of a collaborative interface. It's an interface, think of a video controller like a joystick, but the joystick games change according to your performance. So if you suck at the video game, then there'll be more autonomy of the robot to perform things on their own. Uh, and if you are very good, then they'll give you more control. Does that make sense? And things will adjust on the fly to help you. Uh, if you think about flying a uh, uh, a drone, again, their pilots are very experienced, very good with the controls, but it took them a long time to learn. So we want to introduce a learning at the device, this interface, at this collaborative interface device. So we described this as a neural network and then we monitor the performance and then we adjust the weights of the neural network on the fly. And we want to build an architecture which can take a bunch of sensors, EMG, EEG, Kinect or Vision, uh, E4, this gives you uh, a heart rate, for example, or galvanic skin response, eye tracking, head motion, all kinds of sensors. It's sensor agnostic. So you have this massive array, you put it in that neural network, it gives you some commands for the robot so that you get a better experience. Uh, and we can use some sort of deep network and some deep reinforcement learning uh, technique to, to get that done. So uh, this is taking that ARNA robot, which I, met, I introduced it as a level two assistant. To, if we want to take it into a peer, we need to have it perform as well as a human. Um, so uh, we are actually working on, um, you know, that that deep uh, uh, learning algorithm that I mentioned. Um, there's a lot of details here, but we have several networks in parallel. Some of them are trained with genetic algorithms. Other others are trained with conventional gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent. Some minimize the time of teleoperation and others minimize the jerk, like how the robot performs during teleoperation. And the idea is to uh, calculate these performance metrics of so jerk and completion time and show that this scheme actually helps users 
teleoperate the robot much faster, right on the on the floor here. We've done uh, tests with many users, and uh, we can actually do this fairly quickly. So the learning occurs fa fairly quickly, and the users, even if they're not experienced, not used to the controls, very quickly can actually complete the task. Uh, I mentioned um, experiments with nursing students. Um, we actually evaluated something called the technology acceptance model. This is a popular concept which is used to gauge the level of acceptance of different electronic technologies. So you see here different metrics that get computed like usefulness, ease of use, satisfaction, frustration, skill acquisition and perceived performance. So these are all constructs that could be gauged uh, with a questionnaire at the end of the experience. A lot of these things are correlated. Satisfaction is correlated with frustration. You see those lines means that one influences the other, so they're not independent constructs. So if you have a bunch of questions, like, uh, is the robot helpful to you? Are you comfortable with the robot? You know, they could be related to one or more of these boxes, right? So then if you want to isolate uh, exactly what the robot's doing, then you have to take care of these dependencies. Uh, and we had three tasks. So one was, um, so in the current state of uh, technology with robot walking emulation in the hospital is using a gate belt. So gate belt is nothing but a belt. The nurse puts it on the patient and then it kind of walks with you. If you fall, it can catch you, right? Uh, we actually built this harness device. So a uh, patient can be strapped in this harness. If you fall, the harness is going to catch you so you don't get injured. Uh, so you see here harness with the robot. Then another option is for a gate belt to be around you while you walk with the robot. There's no harness. Uh, and the third one is the simple one. Is there a nurse with a gate belt and there's no robot? So we try to compare. We had some tasks here and we try to compare um, different settings uh, with a, a number, 69 different uh, nursing students. Um, there's some demographics here. A lot of them mostly female. A lot of nurses, that's because that's what we were recruiting. Uh, we did ask questions about, you know, do you like video games or not? Uh, are you more comfortable? So uh, was we wanted to see what are the factors for acceptance of something like this. And we had several interfaces to teleoperate the robot to a tablet or to a joystick. There are different settings, and we kind of varied all these settings here. We used this Latin square design where we first introduced so some cohorts, we first introduced the gate belt. They already knew, knew that. Then we introduced the robot with the harness. Then we introduced, you know, and then we changed the order for another cohort. First we introduced the robot, they did that first. Then they did the walking with the gate belt. So we wanted to vary that sequence because otherwise there could be a sequence effect whenever they answer which one they would, would they prefer. Uh, and then we used uh, something called the linear mixed effects model. This is a model from statistics um, to kind of uh, evaluate the effect of different variables. So uh, dependent variables you see here uh, is what kind of setting, what kind of controller, PID versus NAC here, uh, what kind of input interface we had, the age, the race of the person, and video game playing. So those were inputs and then dependent variables are all from for the technology acceptance model. And uh, here's an example of different sequences I mentioned, which, which you introduce first. So there are different permutations. And um, there are, of course, there's noise in all this, right? There's statistics. Uh, and there could be preferences due to, you know, random preferences because some people prefer something versus the other, and that is, is uh, different from person to person. And we were looking for statistically significant results, and everything in red is actually statistically significant by for the p-value. And this is without considering that those output variables can be correlated. Okay, and so you can see that 
uh, it's not easy to see, but um, the robot in both cases with, uh, with gate belt or harness is preferred over just the human. So that means that, you know, nurses feel fine, comfortable with the robot, actually feel better than them being responsible for the patient falling. Um, so that we can see there's not that much frustration, there's better satisfaction, and they seem to think this is a useful product. So this is sort of evidence that they will be accepting this technology if it's introduced in the hospital. The same kind of things could be done. Now, if you consider TAM, TAM correlation, so uh, different correlation, um, and including uh, correlations between satisfaction, uh, setup, sequence, demographics, uh, ease of use, usefulness, um, different correlations could be tested here. And the results are kind of similar. Um, in general, we can conclude here from this these tests that there are significant positive effects of using the robot in terms of perceived assistance, usefulness, and satisfaction, and negative effects on frustration. So nurses are not frustrated with this. Uh, perceived usefulness and ease of use influence the level of satisfaction. So if you have those two, you will influence satisfaction. And also another conclusion is that there's no significant demographic video blink playing experience of propensity to trust uh, effect. So that means that if the nurse is not really trusting technology, that doesn't have an effect on her views on the robot. So it's all positive. Uh, what we're doing currently is we are deploying the robot in a hospital room. This is a virtual hospital, so this actually runs on Amazon Web Services. Uh, you have different rooms in patients. We can simulate nurses, patients, and we can put several models of this robot. We can spawn them, and we can look at these questions of if you have M robots, N nurses, P patients, what's the best way to allocate your resources in the hospital wing? Um, I will skip this because we're getting towards the end. So I'll just go to conclusion here. So um, human robot collaboration started with human computer collaboration. There's many traits, there's some distinctions because the robot is an embodical, embodied physical intelligent presence, not the same as a computer, right? Uh, I talk about three levels of collaboration, four levels. The fourth one is we don't want to have it be our manager, so I'm not going to talk about it, but three levels. Uh, basically, a tool uh, like a collaborative robot, you can buy it off the shelf. The level two would be an assistant like Arna. Level three, if we move beyond that, we create a peer that would be something a lot more intelligent than Arna. Uh, for our robot, perceived usefulness, assistant, satisfaction, and frustration, do not depend on the way we conducted our experiment um, using our analysis using this linear mixed effect model um, that I mentioned. But there are uh, improved effects uh, on these constructs by using the robot. So the nurses actually preferred the robot over not having the robot, and that's statistically significant. So uh, what we're doing now is trying to move beyond, I uh, mentioned, to level three. We need better sensors, so we're integrating tactile skin on the handlebar of the robot. So now you can squeeze your hands and the robot will go. Or squeeze this hand, the robot will take a turn. Um, we are working on more machine learning and trying to incorporate emotional feedback. Uh, so if we have you know, if the patients are agitated while they're using the robot, then you better slow down kind of thing. And also working on uh, looking at how is that going to affect the workflow in the hospital with nurses uh, on the floor. We're taking the robot to uh, U of L hospital, I mentioned in two months, three months, and we hope to have some, some more data collected during that time. I want to thank uh, all my 
students and staff, long list of students that worked on this over the years. Uh, some of them are here and uh, I'll be happy to acknowledge support from National Science Foundation and uh, I'll take any questions you have. And that was the last one. Any questions for Dr. Poco? Oh. Um, can you show the plot diagram for uh, adaptive robot? Yeah. I couldn't help but notice that there uh, was some control on the velocity of the robot, right? Uh, I just wanted to ask what uh, what type of sensors are used uh, for the velocity feedback in the robot. Yeah, so I mean, robot has encoders. So we can keep track of the angular velocity of the wheels. Oh, yeah, instant. Everything is instantaneous. Yeah. All right. Um, so for your human subject that you did with the gate belt, did that with your students, correct? Yeah. Do you anticipate any changes, or are you planning on doing another study potentially with actual nurses with more experience? Because I would yeah. assume that would affect yeah. their behaviors. Yeah, so that's why we're taking it to the floor uh, of the hospital. That's hard to get nurses right. into the lab, right? Nursing students, actually, we uh, they had a seminar just like yours, so they had a requirement to come to our lab, <laughs> so they did. But uh, nurses, you know, very busy. So we have to take the robot to the floor and let them use it. That's what we're going to do. You're right. Yeah. And the other thing is we need to uh, assess this with patients. Yeah. Older people, younger people, you know, if they want to walk with it and see if they like it. If, is the gate belt a standard care? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Okay. Yeah. That's the level of care right now. And hospitals are evaluated by a uh, number of falls. That's a big metric. And so they take great precautions for that. Uh, so we'll have to do similar things if we have a robot in there, right? You can't have the robot run away with the patient. That's what I Yeah. Um, with the uh, harness uh, system, do you plan to uh, have a body with support system that's stored as well? I mean, uh, not right now. Those are great enhancements though, to think about, yeah. Uh, it's all about, is that easy to put on? Can the patient actually put it on? They need help to put it on? You know, a lot of questions like that, but um, it's possible, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. This is someone, okay. Um, What's the current size of the robot? I know yeah. some of those rooms can get pretty small, especially trying to maneuver yeah. anything in. That's a good point. Uh, all right, so we, when we started the project, we said, okay, we want to, this robot be uh, as wide as a hospital bed. If, you know, if you're going to get into a room where a hospital bed can go, but that, you know, it cannot go. I mean, if you're trying to move door. some hospital beds in and out of rooms, it can take a solid few minutes, so. But uh, my point is, it's not going to get through that door. So a lot of office doors, it won't get through. Uh, now, you can make it smaller and less payload. Uh, right now, if you uh, ride on it or if you brace, like with the harness, robot's not going to tip over. Uh, but if you make it lighter and smaller, you're not going to be able to lean on it or ride on it. So there is trade-offs here. Uh, so right now, the robot's quite wide, 42 inches which is uh, the same as a hospital bed width, and it's square. So it's a little bit big, but it's also sturdy. Yeah, but thank you. I think those are important issues to, dis to, to consider. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I'm kind of thinking about some of the times I've been hospitalized several times, um, and uh, trying to think about how something like that would have impacted that so I know like once after a surgery they they were getting me up and having me walk um, and one of the issues that they had was I wasn't up to walking very much at that point I could walk for maybe a minute you know and I probably needed to walk for like a minute every hour or something but it was more like a minute once or twice a day um, which 
would, you know, something like ARNA could be helpful with that, but it would also have to be something that it wouldn't take more time to get set up and, and going than it would to just have the nurse do the, the walking if the nurse had to come in and, and help with the setup. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of variables. So, right? yeah, I mean, one thing that we learned, for example, is uh, a lot of patients, not you necessarily, but they would try to get out of bed and fall. Yeah. Uh, but they wouldn't necessarily call anybody to help them ahead of time. But if they had the robot there, they can probably right. use it. Yeah, right? well, I mean, and that's that one of the social good. things, because like when, when I've been in the hospital, there is. I, I know the nurse, they're busy, I don't want to bug them. You know, <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, but if it was something like a, a robot yeah. where I know it's just sitting there waiting to do, do yeah. whatever, it would be less of an uh, yeah. inhibition. Um, yeah, I mean, lots of questions about the actual yeah. product. If you were to sell a product, it'll, you know, what features do you put on it? It's, a, it's a, still an open question. There is, uh, there are several, there are two commercial robots right now. Uh, Aetna has a tugging robot, so you can use it to tug beds and other heavy things. There's a robot out of UT Austin called Moxie that does uh, um, delivery of blankets and other supplies. So it goes to the storeroom and brings it to them. It's very useful, but that's all it does. Uh, this would do something slightly different. But the question is, you know, is it justifying the cost? The next question. But thank you. Yeah. Any other? All right. One more. Well, I assume that uh, the mechanical analysis is only for this uh, robot, right? That there is mechanical analysis, stress analysis. Yes, right. there was some. Yes, when we built it. Now, uh, now. I just want to ask about uh, for this type of design. What uh, what's the safety factor? Yeah, so um, we designed the robot with a transmission, right? The motors have transmission so that it can not exceed um, half the average speed of a human. So it's twice as slow as you, so that if it runs away from you, you can go catch it. That was the one design feature. Another has to do with this controller that I mentioned. This controller actually is not going to exceed certain torques. Um, it's got some guarantees, uh, even if, you know, it won't go out of control on you. Yeah. Um, you know, then we have the gate belt, you know, other than that, um, you know, you walk along it, so. Um, but it is a heavy thing, so you can go through the wall with it. And if it run, you know, so there's an e-stop button on it. There's different sensors that can, you know, cut the power on it. So there's some safety features, obviously. Yeah. All right. Okay. Is there anybody on Teams that would like to ask a question? I don't have anyone okay. raising their hands, so thank you very much. All right, thank you okay. guys. We'll see you around. Thank you all. One more thing I want to mention. So we have an open house March 19 at 1 p.m. So you can go see the robot if you want and many other robots at Larry. That's right next to the Green Garage. For a B601 student, just remind uh, the second assignment to do tonight before back closes. Thank you. Have a good weekend. <laughs> <laughs>